So, now is the opportunity for me to give a talk. And for this evening's talk, uh, for once, I just, this evening, just uh, in my room, came here early, decided to give a talk on one of the things which causes a lot of problems in our modern world, it's called the fault-finding mind. It causes a lot of problems in meditation, but it's much deeper than that. And the reason why I came across that talk was recently I had my COVID jab. The reason is now the Astra AstraZeneca, because it had Zen in it. <laughs> and being a Buddhist, I thought that's the appropriate for a monk to have a Zen jab. <laughs> it's very disappointing, I must admit, because people said it was going to have all sorts of problems afterwards. I got nothing. Wasn't tired, didn't hurt, no sort of reactions at all. So I live a very boring life as a healthy monk. <laughs> it's true. But one of the things which I noticed was like sitting in the doctor's surgery in Serpentine, there was a gentleman in there, he was really upset. I'm not quite sure why something the doctors or the nurses weren't doing and he was really upset and he was very angry. And I thought, poor doctors and nurses, I mean, they're trying their very best you know, to serve and to help. And they don't force people to do things, usually. And to listen to why are people so upset? And it's something I hadn't seen you know, in monastery for a long time. Just why do people get so wound up about s small things? And it is because that sometimes people have developed the fault-finding mind. They always see what's wrong in things. They see what's wrong in the medical profession, what's wrong with COVID, what's wrong with the Buddhist society of Western Australia, what's wrong with Ajahn Brahm, what's wrong with the whole world. And some may even see what's wrong with themselves. And they get depressed. Have you ever seen me depressed? <laughs> you know, one of the reasons why, as a monk, you just don't get depressed. It's literally because you haven't developed the fault-finding mind at all. You've actually you know, developed the opposite of the fault-finding mind. And one little story which I was telling a few people during the week, it's, you know, I love telling sort of jokes. It's a funny story, but it's not really so much for the, the joy or the fun of it. It's just you know, how people can relate to this story. And this was a story of a young man and he was really sort of, he was quite bright and got, you know, past his university or whatever, or school or whatever, but he couldn't get a job. And so what happened was that uh, his friends tried to get him a job. You're getting a job somewhere, you know, get to work, get some money for something, and it's good exercise and a good experience for you. So they got him an, a very simple job as, as a waiter in one of the restaurants. You don't have to have much skill about that. You just find out what a person wants and take it to the, the cooks or whatever, and then they give them the food afterwards. And then just after half a day, this young man sort of resigned. Why? What was the problem? And he said, well, look, so if I give all this delicious food to everybody and I can't eat any of it for myself, <laughs> there's so much suffering. I can't stand it any longer, half a day is enough. <laughs> so they said, oh, what can we do with this guy? And they, they came up with a solution. And they said, okay, you can actually be the cashier. Because the cashier, the little area there is all cordoned off. So you can't see the food at all. You may be smelling it, but not that much. And you can just you know, get the bills, count the money, give the change, easy. So oh, yeah, I'll try that. So he became the cashier at the restaurant. After half a day, he gave that up as well. I can't stand this any longer. It's even more torture than serving food, which I can't eat. I count money, which isn't mine. 
I can all the money and I can't put any of it in my pocket. Oh, that's so much torture. And I said, how can we just deal with somebody like this and getting my job? So they talked around each, you know, and they finally came up with a solution, a brilliant solution. They said, the local cemetery needs a cemetery attendant. There's a little like cabin in the front of the cemetery, you know, just where the main gate is. All you need to do is sit in there quietly and just make sure that, you know, the right people come in and they, they don't, no food, you can't see any food there, you can't see any money. So, you know, you should be able to, it's such a simple job. So, okay, I'll give it a try. After half a day, he resigned. I can't stand this any longer. I said, why? Well, I'm sitting in there most of the day and I see all these people lying down and I have to sit up. <laughs> in the cemetery. <laughs> okay, there's a bit of funny story about that, but that is a good example of someone who is a fault finder, big time. Whatever job you do, you'll always find fault in it somewhere. And I tell people, look, even if whatever work you have to do, always remember this, that if you really enjoyed your job, you found a very fulfilling, very worthwhile job to do, don't tell your boss. Otherwise, they'll stop paying you. Your salary, your payment, is a bribe to do a job you'd rather not do. How many of you would, you know, get up on a Monday morning and go to work? Would you, you love doing that? Wouldn't it be better just to sleep in? <laughs> That's the reason you go to work, because, you know, you get paid for it. Let's not call it salary, let's call it for what it really is. Bribe. <laughs> to get you to go to work. And that's why some people just, you know, just do extra work and get more money. So, <laughs> so, if you don't really enjoy your work so much, just think about poor Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Ananda. We don't get paid at all. <laughs> they don't bribe us at all. So, uh, Madam Vice President, so put that. <laughs> One of the reasons that, and, and sometimes the situation, our, our just our work situation, you see where I live, all I can afford is a little cave sleeping on the floor. But I've, I've had gone up in the world because I, a few people asked me earlier on, was it really true that when I first went to Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine, I didn't have a cave, I didn't have a hut, I had a door, that's all. And this door, there was another monk with me at the time, he had two doors, you know, from the salvage yard. And the door was put on three bricks in every corner, 12 bricks in all. And we put a mosquito nut umbrella, which they had in Thailand at those times we brought over here, on top of that, and that's where I slept. I think there was a, I think there was a, a pillow, but no sort of uh, mattress. And my door, we had two doors, the other monk was senior to me, so he got the first choice of the doors. He got the much better door, which was flat. <laughs> my, <laughs> my door had all this ribbing on it. You know, and these really fancy doors had all ribbing all over it. And that's the one I slept on for the first two or three months of in Bodhinyana Island Monastery. But it was one very helpful feature, because I don't have fault finding mine. I see the positive things in things. And the positive things which I saw in my door, it had a little hole in the center where the doorknob used to be. <laughs> of course, we'd taken the doorknob off, so there was a little hole in the center of my bed. So I didn't really need to get out of bed to go to the toilet. That's <laughs> 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 true. <laughs> it was in the forest. <laughs> So uh, when you don't have forefighting, why has he got the better door than I have? Why can't I have a flat door? Why do I have to live like this? This is not right. 
Let's call fault finding. Instead, this is good enough. To have a good night's sleep. This, this is off the ground. So little by little, you see just how fault finding causes so much problems in life. And of course, you know, I'll say just my terms of employment. You know, I haven't got a contract for the BSWA. And so my, <laughs> my pay is non-existent. Food, just one meal a day. Sometimes you get a bit, actually most days you get a breakfast these days, but those days just one meal a day. And just all in one bowl, all gets mixed up. I say that, it's amazing. When you, you see the way we eat, and sometimes you just get these things, you try to separate them, I must admit, but was this one occasion I had um, strawberry ice cream on spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> that's spaghetti bolognese and I was in one part, and that's some ice cream, and the person who took my bowl up just must have just... Uh, <laughs> when I opened the lid, oh my goodness. <laughs> Any bolognese and the strawberry ice cream was on top of it. <laughs> Have you ever had that? <laughs> Why do you think it's nasty? Why do you think it's terrible? Actually, it is nasty and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I always say you get a lot of fun being a monk, as you see. One of the reasons is because you don't you know, you treat it like a kid treats it. It's interesting, it's joyful, let's give it a try, see what happens, and tell all your friends about it afterwards, all the silly things which you eat. And, <laughs> and also, just even like working. Now, this last few weeks, because of maybe COVID, it's been so quite light, but have you ever had to work really hard? Do extra work because of your company or your boss, you know, they really need a bit of extra help, and you have to work really late hours? and sometimes hardly get any sleep at all. How many of you have done that? <laughs> of course I've done that many times before, and many of you have done that. How do you do that? How can you, you work just so hard and even lose sleep? By giving it fun and joy, seeing the purpose of it. Every time there's a meditation retreat on at Jhana Grove now, one of the nuns is doing that. First time a retreat is being, oh no, um, I have some planning done retreats here before, so I can't say that, but this is by Venerable Munisera. So it's wonderful that, yay, bhikkhunis are doing retreats now. But also, <laughs> that every time I do a retreat down there, I always end up telling this story. And those of you who've seen Jhana Grove Retreat Center, state-of-the-art retreat center, Notice the, the floor in the meditation room. It hasn't got a carpet because we thought that some people want to meditate and they have allergies. So it's just a bamboo floor. It's very beautiful. But on that bamboo floor, you know what happens? That again, Ajahn Bum being the builder. Well, not really the builder, but it's my project, so I had to make sure everything was done properly. And I, it's a huge project. I asked the person in charge of doing the building, are you sure it's going to be ready by Easter 2008 or 9 or 12? Or what was it? About 12, 13 years ago, 2008. Are you sure it's going to be ready? He said, yes, no trouble at all. It's you know, well ahead of schedule. And I should know by now, I'm really stupid. I trust people too much. Because <laughs> it wasn't. It was a real rush. Especially the last day, we we're going to have the opening ceremony on, it was on the Easter retreat. I we was going to have it on Friday, you know, the Good Friday. And we'd invited even the, the former Premier, Jeff Gallup. He was going to, be, he still is the, um, what do you call it, the, the patron of Jhana Grove Retreat Centre. And he was going to come and open it for us. And we had, as soon as the opening was finished, we were going to have our retreat, the eight, nine day retreat. And we had all this ceremony all arranged. And you know what happened? You know what happened? It wasn't finished. Thursday evening, half the floor had not been laid. It was just concrete. Half the floor was, was finished, half the floor was bare concrete. We tried to get 
get floor makers in to come and finish it off for us. Would they work on Thursday evening before the long weekend? No way. So what happened? Da, da, da. In come the bucks, like the Seventh Cavalry, to save, save the day again. <laughs> and it was brilliant, it was beautiful. Ajahn Bambali and Ajahn Santuti, they were the main collaborators, they worked till 4 a.m. All night, 4 a.m. And it's a beautiful job they did. If you sit on that, when every time I see that, I feel just so much joy and happiness. Just, you know, just finishing off like that. I had a lot of fun, a lot of joy, not sleeping, working hard. Had an hour or two to sleep before we started the ceremony in the morning. Big ceremony all day. And have a look at it, it's gorgeous. That is how we work. Did we get paid? Imagine if we did get paid. There'll be, you know, it's Easter, so that's double time. <laughs> Overnight, that's double time again. So, <laughs> no sleep. Nighttime work, oh, they could have made a fortune <laughs> if we were paid, but we don't do that. Do it for the fun of it, the joy of it, because you don't have fault finding, you have the opposite joy finding, beauty finding. And that's one of the reasons why, yeah, we don't get paid, we get exploited. <laughs> but please exploit us some more, because we don't think like other people. So instead, we just see the joy of doing these things and the wonder of doing these things, which means the fault finding is not there. So we don't get upset and don't argue. And if you notice carefully, there is a mistake in that floor. I don't know if any of you seen it. It's in the corner which is closest to the entrance door. It doesn't quite match. But it's beautiful. It doesn't have to match and be perfect. And you know, the only people who know that, and you probably know that now, the only people who really know that are the people who did it. Have you ever noticed what you do yourself, you can see all the faults in it. And other people come and say, oh, what a beautiful painting job you did. Oh, what a wonderful thing you did with that um, laying the carpet or whatever. What a beautiful garden you have. You see the faults, but other people don't. Why? It is because the biggest fault finder of all is ourselves to what we do. And of course, I can't go past <laughs> this story about fault finding or why people just have such a difficult life together with themselves or with their partner or their family. It was of the old two bad bricks in the wall story. And that's. I even heard that so many times, but it's, it's one of my favourite stories of my own life, being a monk. Bodhinyana Monastery in Serpentine. When we first got there, we didn't have, no, we were in debt. We had this land, that's why we had to get the doors from the salvage yard. Not really, not a salvage yard, it was a tip. We knew where the tip was, <laughs> and so we got the two best doors we could, which other people had thrown away. And so we, we didn't have any place to stay, just you know, sleep out. And so while well, we built things, and we, I remember I was the main builder there, and I went to the, um, the council and said, well, you know, to be able to stay here, you know, what, what do we really need? And they said, like, health and safety. So it was like toilets. So the first thing which we built was our toilet block. We thought we were crazy, can't you build something more inspiring, like a hall or a kitchen or something? No, we're raising funds for a toilet block. <laughs> but that was all that we could do, was just to raise funds for bricks and, and cement and wood and concrete and stuff. But <laughs> oh, I, I can't, I tell the monks' story last week, that you know, I was, I was really a bad builder in those days because we didn't know where to build. And so there was an, a, a vacant area where the toilet block now is. And I thought, wow, oh, we don't have to cut any trees down. So I spilled it here. But you know the reason why there was no trees there? There was solid rock underneath. There was only about a few inches of soil and then solid sort of granite. And 
So once you made your decision, your plans, and the, were there to build it there, you had to build it there. So what am I going to do with this granite? So we tried with picks. <laughs> that didn't work. If you ever try to pick on granite, you know, just you know, your, your teeth almost f fall out because <laughs> it's very hard. And <laughs> so we had this wonderful fellow who used to come here. He came here uh, recently, Cameron. I always remember his name because he had a license for explosives. So he got explosives, tried to blow it up. Remember, I was only about 28, 29 or something that time. So it was really good fun. <laughs> I must admit, I enjoyed it. Just holding gelignite. And you can't do that these days because of, you know, uh, so many laws and stuff. And then just blowing it up, trying to sort of lower the, the cap rock so we can put pipes through it. Total waste of time, but it's good fun. And for those of you who know Bodhinyana Monastery, one of those explosions, we just put rocks on the top of the jet ignite to try and get the force of the explosion to break up the rock. One of those rocks, you know, you know where the, the monks' uh, place is? One of those rocks went right up to where now where the the women's guest quarters are a long way. It's almost going into space. <laughs> it's very dangerous. Anyway, that's not recommended, okay. <laughs> but anyway, the one we just uh, put a slab down, the next thing was to do the, the brickwork. So I did a lot of the brickwork. And that was my first brick wall. That's actually the, f yeah, it was that wall. First brick wall. And that was that story where I'd, uh, I really took my time and I was really mindful and really careful. Come on, you've got to do this properly because otherwise when people come, they wouldn't put any money in the donation box. So I saw how we wasted it. So I, <laughs> I finished my first brick wall and when I looked at it, oh my goodness, I'd really stuffed up. Stuffed up big time, because the two bricks were crooked. And I thought, oh my goodness, what can I do? So, what would you do? Two bad bricks, you know, you get a sort of uh, a trowel and try and scrape out the mortar to reset them. But that mortar was just like rock, like diamond. You couldn't take it out at all. Well, what can I do? So the next idea which came into my head, and this is, you've heard the story before, but the meaning behind this, when you elaborate on it, is really powerful. The next thing I decided to do, they had a senior monk who had the best door. <laughs> and I asked him, have you got enough money to, to buy some more of that jet ignite and blow up the wall so I can start again? That's what I wanted to do. And if we had, I'd have done that. Just blow it up and start again. Because those two bad bricks, they spoiled the whole wall, in my mind. And they really did. For me, every time, I actually had nightmares about that wall. You know what happens, you, you're in there on your door, and you wake up in the middle of the night, oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> spoiled the first building. And <laughs> the other thing which happened, when any visitors came, <coughs> and took them out to see how the building work was going. And I'd take them, I'd always take them so they wouldn't see that my mistakes, show them something else. Because I was really embarrassed. And I thought, I, I was, like many people, I was a perfectionist. I didn't want anyone else to see my mistakes. So I wanted to hide it, blow it up, do something. But then what happened, the beautiful part of the story, and I don't know who it was, if you know, anybody hears this and you know, they tell me that was them who said this, I just bow to you, because you taught me so much. In a simple statement, I was with this gentleman and they saw those two bad bricks and they said what a beautiful wall that was. You know, sometimes people say those things just to you know, try and suck up to you and try and praise you or whatever, I don't know why. He said, it's a beautiful wall. And I said, are you blind? Have you left your... Are you visually challenged? I think that's what we used to say in those days. Can't you see the two mistakes which spoil the whole wall? 
And what they said next was just absolutely brilliant. They said, yes, I can see those two crooked bricks, but I can also see the 998 perfect bricks. And that really shook me. It shook me because that was the first time in three months that I could see anything other than my mistakes. It was weird. Because it was like when you passed that wall, your eyes would just go to two bricks and you wouldn't see anything else. You thought of it, you just thought of your mistakes. You dreamed of it, you dreamed of your mistakes. And he said, there's bricks to the left, the right, above and below those mistakes. Perfect, beautiful bricks. It's a beautiful wall. You know what, he was right. It was a beautiful wall. And from that day on, it's not just that I didn't need to blow up that wall. I didn't need to feel ashamed of it. I learned how not to be such a fault finder and to focus on two tiny mistakes and forget about all the other beautiful things in that wall. And I've told that story so many times, and you may have heard it so many times, you probably know it better than I do. I will often say that with my stories, that I've heard them more times than anybody. <laughs> Every time I tell them, or write them down in books. But what it really meant, it was pointing out a part of psychology, why do like men and women who've got married, why do they divorce? Why do boyfriends and girlfriends separate? Why do people who have been friends for years suddenly decide they can't stand each other any longer? Two bad bricks in the wall, that's why. And they can't see the other beautiful bricks in the wall. And I've been telling quite a few people that that was the very first story in my first book, Two Bad Bricks in the Wall. And that was when uh, that was published and got popular. I got this invitation to go to Bangkok. Four couples in the Australian embassy in Bangkok had marital trouble. Two were divorced. They'd gone through the divorce proceedings. Two were separated but not divorced yet. When they read that story, they came together again. It's amazing, they were divorced, but they decided to come together again. Separated ones came together again. And they wanted to see me. They wanted to say thank you. So they bought me an airline ticket to go to Bangkok, paid everything. So I give a talk for the people in the Australian Embassy in Bangkok. Say thank you. It worked. How does it work? Of course it works, because especially when you're living with somebody, your partner, of course you see faults in them. If you've got that fault-finding mind, after a while you think, why did I ever marry this person? I must have been dumb. I must have been drunk on drugs or something. Why did I marry her? Oh, I must have been dumb to marry him. <laughs> have you ever felt like that? <laughs> you don't look at it that way. You look at it, as I often say sitting here, yeah, he's not perfect, but then neither are you, are you? So you're a match. <laughs> Put it bluntly. <laughs> But you don't just you know, look at the bad things, look at the good things in that person. And there's so many of them. And that's what they were doing. They're seeing the, not the bad bricks in the wall, but the beautiful bricks in the wall of the person they were living with. And they say, actually, they're not that bad a person after all. <laughs> little by little, you notice that seeing the faults in things, the mistakes which people make, the sort of stupid things we do from time to time, those, seeing those faults and focusing on them, that becomes the fault-finding mind. And at least you want to destroy things, to blow up things, to go to the lawyers and get the separation, ask for compensation, or whatever it is. That fault-finding mind creates so much damage in this world. I wanted to blow up that wall. 
And I would have done if you know that kind per- if we had any money, and if that kind person had not come up and told me the solution. There's other bricks in the wall, but I can't go past the two bad brick story without uh, <laughs> one of the other stories. I, I told that story; it's one of my favourite stories to tell to people with cancer. You've got cancer, you've got a tumour in you somewhere. Is that all you've got in your body? Just one or two tumours? Two bad bricks in your wall? This is actually quite challenging, but it works. Well, anyway, <laughs> after I told that story to um, one of the, uh, to the cancer group, this builder came up, I love this ending to the story, this builder came up to me and said, Ajahn Brahm, you don't have to worry about making mistakes. All builders make mistakes. Or it, never, it doesn't exist a perfect bricklayer. But he told me, he said, this is a secret, he said. And of course, you all know the secret by now. If you don't know, you're going to hear it in a few moments. The secret is that when, as a builder, we make a mistake like that, two crooked bricks, we tell our client that it's a feature. <laughs> There's no other house <laughs> in Perth like this. We charge them an extra couple of thousand dollars. <laughs> and I just love that ending to the story because it's true. The things which are wrong, the things which we think are just we should fix up, the things we find fault with, are they really that bad or are they the beautiful features of life? So we don't find fault with things and want to fix it or destroy it or hide it. It's a force becomes the beauty. We learn so much from seeing those faults. So little by <laughs> one of the things, you see the faults in your partner, oh come on. Just it makes life a bit more interesting and fascinating and <laughs> and have some fun with that. Just I remember just those days I used to go and help my, when my mother was still alive, because it's Mother's Day on Sunday, isn't it? Yeah, so I'm just remembering my old mother, she died a long time ago. <laughs> but anyway, when I used to go and visit, I was, I was a monk, monk can visit uh, their mothers. So when I used to go, now how can I do something instead of just sitting next to my mother and watching the TV, which she did most of the time. I wanted actually to do something to help her. So, yeah, I was a bit of a builder, fit, healthy. So I decided to do some decoration for her in her little apartment. So painting the ceiling. And then <laughs> I told my mum, she said, said, why is most of the ceiling, now why are we using so much paint? She asked me. I said, because most of it ends up on the floor. <laughs> I was painting the ceiling. <laughs> So it happened, of course, it's really hard to paint on the ceiling, it's just most of it just <laughs> falls off. <laughs> that wasn't that skilled. <laughs> but instead of actually finding fault, I had a lot of fun, enjoyed doing things like that. So little by little, instead of like looking at faults, you look at the beautiful side of life. You're not the most perfect painter, but the fact I was trying for my mum and doing the best I possibly could. So that makes life much more warm. And also, I've been doing that such a long time, I don't find fault with myself. Every time my robe slips off, oops. <laughs> you don't use it to criticize yourself. I don't find fault with myself either. That's why I don't improve. <laughs> Do you want to improve? Do you want me to improve? Do you want your, your partner to improve? Sometimes, sometimes I say this, and there's something to this. Send them to a retreat. If you want your husband to be much more kind and sensitive and easygoing and more amenable in every which way, send them to a meditation retreat. It works. It's just like when you have a car. You send it to the garage to get tuned up. That's what we do at meditation retreats. <laughs> Tune up husbands. 
<laughs> and, and wives as well. And it's actually true. <laughs> there was this guy, good old stories, years and years ago. You know, we had to have these weekend retreats. He always wanted to go on a weekend retreat. He told me this story. It's a beautiful story. And when there was a weekend retreat, I said oh, to his wife, can I go on the weekend retreat? He said, what are you talking about? We've got to do the shopping, the cleaning, look after the kids, take them here, go to the dentist, we've got to mow the lawn. Oh, you, it's too much to do. You can understand that, you know, having a family, having a house, there's so much you have to do on weekends. So she said, no. But he was very persistent. Any husbands here want to go on retreats, this is how it's done. <laughs> he asked, next time we retreat, he asked again, oh, is there a retreat on? Can I go? No, of course you can't go. Mother's coming this weekend. The kids need to be uh, taken here and taken there to their sports. And there's so much cleaning. You've got to clean up the, the shed. You promised to do that for weeks. Okay. And he was persistent. Now, this is a trick, guys. I've never been married, but I know all about it, how it works. <laughs> <laughs> One day he said, oh, there's another retreat. I don't know how many times he said this, but there's a retreat on this weekend. Can I go? She was so fed up with him. He said, okay, you go on your stupid retreat and leave me with the kids and the shopping and the cleaning. He took that as a yes and went. <laughs> <laughs> it's only for the weekend. <laughs> she was really annoyed at him. But then when he came home, he came home, he was really changed. You know, like soft and kind and lots of loving kindness and not fault finding and peaceful and very helpful. You know, when you do your little chores in the kitchen and they learn how to do this and cook that. And she was amazed at the change in her husband, just a weekend. And what a most wonderful guy he was to live with. This is absolutely true. The next time there was a retreat, he came on the retreat and said, oh, you got permission from your wife to go on the retreat again? He said, no, no, I didn't have permission to go. She just gave me the money and sent me. <laughs> 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 because what was happening there was they saw the results of a person who learns how not to be so fault-finding. Imagine your partner, husband, wife, if you could actually take all that fault finding away, imagine what a beautiful person that would be to live with. And instead just appreciating the goodness and the kindness, you know, in people, and in the house, and the place you live. That positivity. <laughs> what a wonderful person that would be to live with. So that's one of the reasons why, to learn how to let go of the fault finding mind and appreciate my but what about when things do go wrong? They're the features of life. That's where we learn and we grow when things go wrong. <laughs> oh, this is how I was taught by Ajahn Chah, the teacher. Every time I did something stupid, it caused my teacher to laugh so much. I think that's why he had lots of Western monks, Ajahn Chah to entertain him. <laughs> oh, these stupid stories. There was, one, there was one of the, oh, these young ladies who came from England. Because her father was head of the English Sangha Trust, that's the people who run the monasteries in England. So she came and said, sing. 18th birthday present, go to Bangkok, Thailand. But she came out to the monastery for a few days. And in the, the place we had for visiting uh, lay people, actually I built that one, I remember building that place. And uh, because they had squat toilets, you know, there were squat toilets in Asia. And what about people who can't use a squat toilet, have to sit down? So we had a little um, thing we could actually put on the top of the squat toilet, you know, which made it look like a uh, a Western toilet. We had that just put in the corner somewhere, just for storage. And this young lady, 18 years of age, 
I said, oh, that's a toilet. She sat on it. I did a number two <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> and when she came to apologize, I said, no, thank you. That's made our day. We're going to tell that story for years afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't fault finding. <laughs> Instead, tell some more mistakes you did. <laughs> well, like, you know, you've seen the old the spittoons we use uh, for monks. We haven't got any here. But you know, in the dining area, the little spittoons. Of course, <laughs> some people, they're visiting monastery for the first time. Oh, come and have something to eat. So they get there, they see the monks with these beautiful bowls, they see these little spittoons, and so that's what they put their food in and <laughs> stay <It's like> <laughs> Oh, we get so much laughter by not having any rules put down there and just people learning on the casino. There's nothing wrong with doing things like that. You don't get embarrassed about it. And of course, you know, my first time I'd learnt learning Thai language, many of the Thai people know this story. But <laughs> that very early days in Thailand, all the monasteries were really poor. What well, Pong, where Ajahn Chah lived, where I first went, was really poor. So whenever you got anything, they had a big water jar, and he just put those things in the water jar. There might be toothpaste or toothpaste, uh, to, toothbrushes or anything you needed, like a towel. And so if you needed something, you just go and ask Ajahn Chah, I said, I, you know, I need some toothpaste. And you just look inside there and say, oh, I need some. I'll just give it to you. So this time I needed some soap. You know, obviously, you know, to wash. And, but you had to ask in Thai. So, you know, my Thai was not that good. So the word for soap is sabu. I asked for sapo. Is that any difference there? Sapo, sabu. But apparently, sapo means pineapple. <laughs> so, so I asked my great master, can I have a pineapple, please? <laughs> and he said to me, he said, it was very kind. He said, what do you want a pineapple for? And I said, to wash. <laughs> he never let me forget that. He said, oh, you know, people in England, you know, they, they, they don't use soap like us, they're far more advanced, they use pineapples. <laughs> so, what? This Western culture is way, way ahead of ours. <laughs> so, your mistakes cause so much laughter and joy and happiness, so why be a fault finder? Now that, <laughs> that Buddha was absolutely true. You know, when he said, when we make a mistake, it makes it more beautiful, it's a feature, and we charge people more for that. There's more truth in that than you recognize. So it's the same when we don't have a fault finding in mind, that how we can live together in peace and harmony so easily. You see people do stupid things, they have stupid ideas. <laughs> and it's the same as when we meditate. You don't have a fault finding mind how powerful meditation becomes. And I've mentioned that, if you're smart enough, the meditation which I taught today, I call it the Emperor's Three Questions one now. Emperor's Three Questions meditation, now it's the only time you have. What's the most important thing to be aware of when you're meditating? What's your meditation object? People keep telling me, should we be watching the breath? Where should we be watching our breath? How should we be watching the breath? Should we be watching something else? Watching our body? Watch this go up, let's go down. What should we be doing? What should we be watching? Ah. <laughs> and the answer was, whatever's in front of your mind right now is the most important meditation object in the whole world. This is a brilliant answer. And that actually comes from a Tolstoy story, which, you know, you've heard me say that before, the Empress Three Questions. The most important time is now, easy one. The most important person is the one right in front of you. Dorothy, you're the most important person in the world for me right now. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> 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 
But what that meant is you really pay attention to what's happening right in front of you, right in this moment, even in meditation. And then what do you do? And it's this beautiful saying, you care. You don't find fault on what to get rid of it and go somewhere else. You care for this moment. Even if it's unpleasant, you're having a difficult day, be with it. It's teaching you something. All the times I've had sicknesses, pains, COVID injections or whatever, instead of getting upset and angry about it, whatever happened to you, you learn from it, you welcome it, you care for it. It's amazing when you're in difficult situations how you can care for things. And when you care for things, it's like you're all in it together and it's, oh, <laughs> what's the time? Oh yeah, have you, has any of you ever stayed, what's it in the, it is the Hilton in Perth. I spent one night in the Hilton Hotel in Perth. <laughs> what happened was going to an international flight somewhere, I forget where it was, going to, but you'd already checked in, you know, through the immigration and stuff, so you're technically not in Australia. But then the flight was cancelled or something was wrong with it, so they had to put us all in the hotel for the night. And I couldn't go back to Bodin Yard and Monash, you couldn't come back to here even. Because, you know, you had to be like quarantined, you weren't really in Australia, but you know, you physically were in Australia. So I got a night in the hotel, yay! And a nice meal in the morning, yay! Is that good? I thought it was interesting, I enjoyed it. It's the only time I could ever go in a hotel in Perth to stay, <laughs> stay the night for free. <laughs> I forget what the airline was, but anyway. So when things go wrong for me in my life, it's not really wrong at all. It's always opportunities different ways of looking at things, and have fun, and joy. So little by little, you find that when you don't have a fault-finding mind, there's so much joy in different experiences you can have, in whatever happens to you in this life. In meditation, when I realize, if I'm sleepy, sleepiness is the most important thing in the world for me. I care for it. I don't try and get rid of it. That's negativity. I don't try and want something else. That's just craving. I'm with whatever I have to do. And I enjoy it. Whenever I get put in these situations as a monk, <laughs> which I know nothing about, Sometimes I, oh, I told you that time when I went to the 2019 World Computer Conference in South Korea. And look, you know, you know about my computer skills. <laughs> They're way, way down there. I don't know much what I'm doing. I managed to. <laughs> but I went, and it was the keynote address. Okay, and all these big companies, the Googles and Samsung and LG, they were all there. And Ajahn Brahm, the Buddhist Society of West Australia, we were there <laughs> in the World Computer Conference. <laughs> and they kept on asking me, what are you doing here? Or going, it's, life is really interesting being a Buddhist monk. Or going to that state dinner at Parliament House in, in, in um, Canberra. How many of you have been to a state dinner? I have. Could I eat? No, because I can't eat in the evening. So I went there. <laughs> that beautiful story about, I got the invitation. That was when John Howard, he was the Prime Minister, and when Queen Elizabeth for the Melbourne, is it Commonwealth Games? Yeah, Melbourne Commonwealth Games. So I went there for that one, for the state dinner. I wasn't competing in the, in the Commonwealth Games, although I really I should have done the high jump. It's very easy if you can levitate, you know, just high jump, which would be pretty easy. <laughs> but then, then when you got the invitation, because it's big, you know, it's this like big invitation, dinner with Queen Elizabeth, whoa. And so we, 
we got the card. I think I still got it somewhere. I'll have to search for it somewhere. But anyway, the, uh, you're invited to the dinner in State Parliament's house with uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Request the company of the Venerable Ajahn Brahma Wangso. Wow, how can you refuse that? Until you see the dress code. This is true, I've told this story many times, it's a wonderful story though. So, that was just first item for dress code. Because you can't just walk in there, you've got to have, you know, it's a formal dinner, crikey. So the first, <laughs> the first option of dress was called a black tie. Now, I've never been to a state dinner before. I don't know what they wear, is that all you wear, just a state, a, a tie? No trousers, no shoes. <laughs> It's cold. Cold means a jacket and tr uh, nice shoes and trousers and stuff. I can't go wearing that. We haven't got. I haven't got one. So, and the next, the next option was military uniform. Oh come on! I'm a Buddhist monk. I'm a pacifist. It's kind of a military uniform. So I was losing hope until I saw the third option. That's right, a long dress. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked up in long dress. It's the only thing I had. <laughs> and then the security grabbed me. <laughs> they did. <laughs> they said, are you supposed to be in here, sir? And I got out my invitation. Yes, I'm supposed to be in here. Okay, go in. <laughs> so you have a lot of fun, you know, when you, you, know, you don't sort of find fault and you just allow the life. If the things are really, really wrong, you find out if you don't find fault with things but can be calm and kind and care, a lot of times you can heal a lot of difficult situations. Sickness and, e sickness and ill health. How much in your body is not sick? This is one of those reasons I can't keep on talking for too long, but when I told that story, or this story about fault finding mind in the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore at that time, when afterwards, a guy was a Catholic, and he said, can you please come to my ward in the Institute of Mental Health to bless my ward? I said, yeah, of course. I said, but you're a Catholic, are you okay with this? He said, no, it doesn't matter. But he said, I really appreciate what you've been teaching and your attitude. And I was, I was really interested to find out well, what have I done? What have I taught which makes a Catholic want to invite a Buddhist monk to bless his ward? And he said, what, what are you doing here? And he was the professor of schizophrenia in Singapore. Professor, and he said, "That's you no know, my ward. We treat people who are admitted with schizophrenia, you know, very extreme cases." And I think you've all had experience of seeing other people with schizophrenia. It's a terrible disease. It's so hard to look after. And then I asked him. I knew there was something up here somewhere. I said, how do you treat schizophrenia as a professor, as a boss, the head guy in Singapore? And he said, I, just as you said, Ajahn Brahm, I don't treat schizophrenia as a professor of schizophrenia in Singapore. I treat the other part of the patient, which isn't schizophrenic. And I knew what I'd said before, and I knew exactly what he meant there. And it's not supposed to be done, especially in Thai tradition, to put your hands up to a lay person out of respect, but I did that. I respected that fellow. Sad, sad, sad. You've understood, you've got it. There's no such thing as a person with schizophrenia. This person who has schizophrenic moments, they're not always schizophrenic. 
there's another part to them as well. They show schizophrenia. It's really so debilitating often. What about the other part of them? You don't see the faults. You see the other part, which is beautiful. When you go and see people in jail, murderers, gangsters. I remember seeing, was it not, uh, Ronnie Cray, one of the London East End gangsters once, and seeing all these people have done some really terrible, terrible, hurtful crimes. But I never saw a criminal. Never seen a criminal, a thief, a rapist, a murderer yet. You've seen a person. A person who's done those terrible, terrible acts. But there's more to them than the acts which they've been put in prison for. You see, there's more to that person who's suffering from schizophrenia moments. And that's what I was teaching. And that's what the professor saw. A fault-finding mind who sees the faults and thinks that's all that's there. I just thought, thought there was just two bad bricks there and I couldn't see any other bricks in my wall. When they were pointed out to me, it wasn't such a bad wall after all. When it's pointed out that person is very sick and it's pointed out to them too. They're more than those schizophrenic acts. Your husband, your wife, your poor kid, who you love to bits, but is not doing that well at school. What do I always say? If your kid is coming in the top 5% or bottom 5% at school, you are not a good Buddhist parent. Buddhism, we celebrate the middle way. Avoid extremes. <laughs> you may think that's just a joke, but that's actually quite heartwarming for many people because most people are in the middle there somewhere. Say so if they happen to be smart, fine, but if they happen to be dumb, and you think that's terrible, come on, you can do better than that. No! That's who they are. And so when you acknowledge they're right there in front of you, they're your kid, your partner, your relation, who has schizophrenia, episodes of, they're right in front of you. How they're acting right now, the most important thing in the world. Care for them. Don't try and cure them. Don't try and cure the two bad bricks in the wall. They're the feature. Don't try and get rid of the faults in life, the faults in the government, the faults in, what else is the faults in the weather? How about caring for it instead? And yourself, your own meditation, don't try and cure all the difficult things you experience in meditation. I told that to many monks. If you have difficulty calming your mind, wonderful. Because it's so much a longer journey into deep meditation for you. If you find it difficult, you'll be a far greater teacher than I can ever be. Because you know, you have all this wide experience of what it's like to get lost and how it's like to get back on the path again. I've had too easy a life in my meditation. So you'll be a much greater meditation teacher than I. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. In other words, you can see the benefits whenever you have difficulties and troubles in life. That's where we learn. That's where we grow. They're the tests whereby we learn much greater depth of wisdom, compassion, peace and acceptance. We learn that you don't need to be perfect. For goodness sake, if you were perfect, you'd be just a pain in the in the AWS. <laughs> in other words, you know, you all have your difficult, diff <laughs> different idiosyncrasies. Like me, I tell these stupid jokes all the time. Can I finish with that stupid joke about shopping? Did I tell that last week? Okay. <laughs> Where 
Where does a one-armed man go shopping? Where does a man with only one arm go shopping? In the second-hand shop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sometimes that's what people ask, you know, and say, oh, who gave the talk this evening? I jump by, what jokes did he tell? <laughs> and sometimes all people remember. Anyway, we've got some questions from overseas, first of all. Those who need to go back can go back now. I promise I won't tell any bad jokes. From Germany, how can I stop thinking of things I did wrong and I cannot say I'm sorry because the people are dead? They come up by themselves. I do not look. Where do they come from? Things you did wrong, all the things which you did in your life, if you think they are wrong, don't ever think like that. They are learning experiences. When you're at school and you make a mistake, that's where you learn. So you, don't, you can't expect to be perfect, because we're learning here. So thinking of things which they, you did wrong doesn't help at all. Every, we actually think way too much. So instead of thinking, feel. We celebrate thoughts too much in our culture. We just don't celebrate, no, don't get rid of your thoughts. Thoughts are great, but I think we're overdoing it. And we're not feeling and experiencing much. So you may be going you know, down the beach and you're thinking, thinking, thinking. And you're missing the beautiful sunset which is happening. Or you'll be worried about COVID and you can't travel here, can't travel there. You can always travel to Bodhinyana Monastery or Dhammasara Monastery and see the beautiful people there. So there's always different ways of looking at things. So don't think things you did wrong. How about thinking of things you did right? If you think about the things which you did right, that's much better than thinking of the things you did wrong, but not thinking at all. Then actually instead of listening to the words going on in your brain, you can see the life which is actually happening right now around you. From Hong Kong, next one. Next question. I'm living with a fault-finding person finding faults with me. How can I stay calm within myself? Now you're finding fault with your partner because she finds faults with you. <laughs> Allow her to find faults with you. And some of if they find a really good fault, I don't know, can you laugh? When people find fault with you, the stupid things which you do. So anyway, if you can have more lightheartedness, you're living with a fault-finding person, but you ask them, just, are you a fault-finding person? They'd probably say, yeah, you're the same. So you are a match after all. But anyway, finding faults with you, see if you can encourage the beautiful side of you, to see that as well. We all have faults. I've got many faults. Ananda's got many faults. Each one of you got heaps of faults. <laughs> you all know that, don't you? So you need to find faults. How about finding the beauty in somebody? Their good qualities, their kindness, the wonderful things they've done, and celebrate that. From Pennsylvania, Dear Ajahn, how do you quiet the fault-finding forces in your mind ingrained in childhood by people you trusted like parents? Yeah, you had that put in you, you're not good enough, you're not so smart enough, you're not beautiful enough. But then, you tune in every Friday night to the BSWA and you hear just how beautiful you are, how wonderful you are. So treat me like a, a dad and an under like mum. <laughs> Oh no, sorry, I has a panya. That's a dad and mum. <laughs> and you find when you associate with wise people and smart people rather than with people who are not really so highly attained, then actually you get so much more uplift. You know, sometimes that people go to places like Bodhinyana Monastery and I was just talking to an old Bodhi Dajjo, how many monks are supposed to be there for the range retreat? And this huge number of people coming for our range retreat at Bodhi Nyana Monastery. Mm -hmm. We keep on building new huts, they get filled up straight away. And I think it's 23 or something. 
a huge number of monks over there. Why do they like going there? There's other monasteries which they don't want to go. Why? Why do you like going to Bodhinyan Monastery or Jhana Grove or to here? Why? Instead of going somewhere else on a Friday night. Peace, but it's more than just peace. It's the kindness there. The fact you are not judged. You find that you're accepted. You know, how many of you are perfect? How many of you deserve <laughs> to go to Jhana Grove? <laughs> If you think like that, of course, none of you will. But then after a while you feel you're good enough. This beautiful sense of seeing the beauty, the goodness, the strength, the good qualities in yourself. It's one of the reasons why, with Venerable Ananda and many others, during the start of COVID, we asked all these young monks to give talks and put them online. Have a look at those talks. These are young monks just starting off in life. And they're brilliant, they're great. And you tell them it's great, they say, oh no, 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 I'm not, I'm not an Ajahn Brahma, I'm an Ajahn Brahma, oh, mine's not good. But they are. And after a while you, you, you change your attitude that you are someone who's a beautiful, kind, wise person. And when you start to say, it was a shock to me when I started giving talks, they were hopeless. They really were. People would walk out of the room, I jump up tonight, oh crikey, it's going to be boring. <laughs> but then after a while you learn, you grow and you find the beauty in things. And that's just amazing to be able to see that. Anyway, but that's, um, after a while, yeah, it's ingrained in childhood, you have to work so hard to actually to live up to people's expectations. When you stop trying that, and this, this is the only time you have this moment, and the people in front of you are the most important people in the whole world. And the only thing to do is to care. Can you do that? Can you care? When you're by yourself, you see yourself with all your faults, care. Don't try and fix up your faults. Sometimes the, some of the Senior people in our Buddhist society, hey, Chempram, you know, you should, you know, we really care about you. You should you know, learn how to lose some weight. I said, no. Because if I did that, I'd embarrass all the other monks who are overweight. So I sacrificed myself for all the other members of our Buddhist society. <laughs> Who are overweight. So look, actually, Ajahn Brahm, he's, you know, I, I, I follow Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> Out of kindness, we do that. <laughs> so in other words, you don't try and cure yourself, you care for yourself. Anyway, um, from Portugal. How can I overcome, and the, your parents, you know, who, you trusted them, they try to do the best to try and make you into a beautiful person, but sometimes, when we try to make someone into a good person, we criticize them too much. Yeah, you know your parents criticize you way too much. They didn't realize they were doing something which was hurtful. They're trying to encourage you to do much better. But how many times do I criticize you, Ananda? How many times should I criticize you? <laughs> <laughs> that's not the, I found that that's not the way to get the best out of people. You know, build them up. Just uh, praise them whenever they do something good. And then they just want to do better. From Portugal, how can I come, oh, how can I overcome long time hate I feel for my father's past violent behavior? Oh, you poor, I'm saying this, it's poor you because I'm not quite sure what he did, but your poor father, he probably still loves you and feels very embarrassed about that. And, you know, it's, he didn't really know what to do. Because sometimes, the, you know, we react out of what we think is the best. But we know it all goes pear-shaped, we don't do the right thing. So eventually, hopefully, your father will learn, but getting angry at him or uh, trying to push him out of your life, that's not going to help your father at all. But, okay, it's a bit of a two or three minute story, which many of you know because I've said it a few times before. My father would, you know, was a very kind man, but he would never tell me about my paternal grandfather, my father's dad. 
And that was frustrating for me. Every time I asked him, you know, what was my, fa your, my grandfather like in Liverpool? He said, don't ask me, be quiet. And then eventually when I was about 14 or 15, I got it out of my dad. I was persistent, you've got to tell me because you know, this was my family. I never saw them because they died during the Second World War before I was born. So what was my paternal grandfather like? And that is when my dad said, and please excuse the word, but this is what he said. He said, your grandfather was a bastard. He said it with just so much pain in him. That shocked me. I said, why? And he said he was an, a, not a sexual offender, but a physical offender. He would come home almost every evening drunk. He was a plumber. He'd come back drunk and he'd take off his belt and he'd whip any kid which you know, he came across and then he would start beating his wife, my dad's mum. And my dad often said that, you know, the, the pain of just the end of the belt for no reason at all, just my father was drunk. That would never hurt as much as seeing his mother beaten for no reason at all. He said, that really hurt because he could do nothing to help someone he loved, my paternal grandmother, which I never saw. But what I say the story for is what my father did about that. He was a child at the time, he could do nothing except to make this resolution. He told me, he shared with me this time. He said, when I was at the end of a beating, for no reason, just because my father was drunk, I made this resolution that if ever I survive and have kids myself, and of course he did, me and my brother, if ever I survive, I will never ever do that to my kids. I won't use corporal punishment at all. I always remember that. Because I remember several times, you know, brother and I were naughty, just ordinary kids. And sometimes he'd come into our bedroom with a slipper. He just couldn't do it. He just put the slipper down and walked out. Because he remembered just what it was like for him. And he said he made that resolution he was going to keep it. When he told me that, it really inspired me. That even if you have been physically abused by someone, you can turn that into something beautiful, like my father did. He said he knows what it's like. So he would never do that to anybody. And that was really moving when he told me that story. That's why I shared it with you. Hate or feel for your father. Don't know why your father did that. You can sort of understand why my grandfather always would get drunk. His life had very little meaning. Depression years, struggling to get by. Big house. Only fun he had was going to the pub and getting drunk. And it was the beer which was causing that violence. Anyway, the last question from Singapore. <laughs> of course, I can understand this from Singapore. How do you balance pushing forward, working hard, despite sickness or tiredness, and being kind to your body? Because it's tough in places like Singapore, because everybody works really, 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 really hard. And just like um, Ajahn Santuti and Ajahn Bamali working all night, to finish off, the, actually they sent me to bed, go off my bum, you've got to look after people tomorrow morning. And doing all that work on the bamboo floor. They did that because it was a great sacrifice for the body. And I didn't actually go to the point that sometimes I work very hard. <laughs> Crazy stuff I did with, when I was teaching, going off to flying to Singapore, and as soon as you land, giving a talk, and then just t starting a retreat, and the amount of hours when you count them, just talking to people and teaching, it was just endless. You get very, very tired, but you keep on going. And one of the things which I got lots of energy out of is from inspiration. Pushing hard forward, working hard, this is for a really important goal, like you know, finishing off a retreat center. That's amazing, a retreat center. So you can go meditate and in comfort and beauty. Or if it's like uh, 
building like a nun's monastery. I always get inspired by bhikkhunis because I know how rare that is and how beautiful it is to have equity. You know, you have people of both genders able to live a monastic life just like everybody else. It's rare here. And getting people who are gays, lesbians, transgenders, whatever, come in, welcome. They're not just rejected, which is crazy stuff. So anyway, we push forward. And of course, sometimes, you know, I just uh, get suffering from that, punished from that physically, but I get so inspired. I'm being rejected from all those friends, you know, I grew up with as a monk in Thailand when I would give the ordination to bhikkhunis. I said, do you regret that, Ajahn Not a tiny bit. It was a beautiful, inspirational thing to do. So, you know, to sacrifice so much, you push forward, you worked hard, sickness, tiredness, no, it needs to be done. So you just go and do it. Inspiration is what I use to overcome tiredness. If it's something which really needs to be done, worthwhile doing, get out there and do it. Physically you feel tired at the end of the day, but emotionally you feel just so high. And at the end of the week, when you're caught up on your rest, you feel so wonderful, that was really worthwhile doing. So whenever you see something which really needs to be done, don't think about physical tiredness. You will get physically tired, but emotionally you get a big high, a huge amount of energy for your mind. And that's much more important. People otherwise get depressed. They get fed up, what's the point? Because they haven't done anything which really amounts to something. So it's amazing what you've all done here. Even those working in the little room back there doing the IT stuff, making these talks available to the world. And now, what's, oh, what happened? Oh, you're taking it down there, the YouTube thing. Oh, we had a big thing there, just how many people come to listen in every week from overseas, it's a huge number. Oh, they put it somewhere else. Okay, it's up there somewhere. But anyway, <laughs> It's amazing just if you, how much this goes around to so many people in our world and everyone, because we want some more people to help out with the audiovisual work. It's a huge amount of good karma doing things like that. I can give a talk, Ajahn Brahmada can give a talk, I Hasapani can give talks. Venom Minister can give a retreat down in, in China Grove this weekend. But to share that around, with people in places where you don't have any access at all to such teachings. That is magnificent. They always say, and the Sri Lankans here, or those people who know their suttas, the gift of Dhamma is the greatest gift you can ever give. And to help share that with other people in the world, whoa, that's huge. You don't realize it. Finish off with those other silly stories. Just came to my mind. Last time I was in the UK, just getting off the underground, going to Paddington Station to get to Oxford where I was going to give a talk. Just walking through Paddington Station, just minding my own business. And this woman came running towards me. I said, ah, Are you the YouTube monk? <laughs> That's what she called me, the YouTube monk. And then I didn't have time to answer. She looked me in the face, yes, you are. <laughs> and then she said, I just want to say thank you to you. You saved my life. She was going through a divorce, or not a divorce, a separation from her long-term partner. And that she got really depressed and suicidal. Doctor couldn't help, psychologist couldn't help, psychiatrist, whoever she saw, none of them could help. And then, she was just, you know, at the end of her rope, as they say, and then she just managed, somehow or other, to, to get on YouTube. And I think she got that, one of my famous talks, The Four Ways of Letting Go. And she listened to it, and it was, wow, this makes so much sense. And she listened about three or four that time, one after the other. And she said that got her through her crisis. 
She told all her friends, you must go and listen to these things as well from the BSWA, all for free. And then afterwards she said, thank you. Thank you so much for saving my life. Not me, I did my bit. But each one of you made that talk available. So a young woman, she was Afro-English, over in UK, could have her life saved and have so much joy and happiness meeting so the YouTube monk and all the people who made that possible. So if you have a little bit of time, you don't have to come here to do this, you can be wherever, but have some time, internet skills, internet skills, wonderful thing to be able to do. So, and you're part of it. I see that head on, face on, just the amount of effect this has in our world. Huge. Sometimes you don't realize that. You come here on a Friday evening, and how many thousands of people. What, how many is it just on a, like a Friday night talk? Get online. I know that Four Noble, the Four Ways of Letting Go, it's been over a million is it downloads, isn't it? Online, but when they download it afterwards? Okay, and it's much more than that. Because so I think that four, no, that four ways of letting go, then I went over a million. A million people in the world watch that. It's huge. Ooh, goosebumps. So anyway, that's actually hard work, but you just push forward because it inspires you and you get a huge amounts of energy back. Okay, any other questions from the floor? Okay, I know I can, you don't need to read people's minds, you know one of the most important questions at this time is, can we go now? <laughs> <laughs> so we can bow, bow three times to Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we can go our own ways. Oops. Arahang Sama Sambuddho Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwa Demi Suakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami <laughs>